Thank you, everyone, way up in the back over there, and the rest of you sprinkled everywhere across this thousand person auditorium. If any of you are motivated to come down this way, you're welcome to do so. Not required to do so, but you are welcomed to do so. Okay, we've taken that as optional. Got it. All right. So before I get too far, um, uh, go ahead and for me, um, stand up if you have written software for, let's say, more than a month. More than a month. Okay, look around. These are all the people who have written more than a month. Get to know your friends. I know it's the end, but you know, get to know them. All right, um, stay standing if you've written software for more than a year. Okay, how about uh, two years? Standing for more than five years. Let's double this sucker. Standing more than, stand if you've been writing software for more than 10 years. More than 10 years. Okay, we're gonna double it again and see where we end up. Stay standing if you've been writing software for more than 20 years. Wow. All right, so we have what looks like one, two, about that many. That's great. Okay, so for those of you who are standing, I just have a question for you. Raise your hand if you feel like in this conference you learned something. Okay. Imposters, all of you. You mean to tell me you've been writing software for 20 years and you learned something this day? Are you kidding me? This is ridiculous. Oh my gosh, you mean you keep learning? That's funny. Well, let me tell you a quick story and you can sit down. So you <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know. What happened to those punch cards? So let me tell you a story about Eugene. So in the mid 90s, there's a gentleman that came into uh, UCSD in San Diego with an interesting condition. Now Eugene's condition was that he could hold a conversation, very articulate, very knowledgeable individual, but then you'd start, to you'd start to notice these really interesting sort of things, quirks he would do. Like you would have introduced yourself to him, oh I don't know, about five, six, seven minutes prior and now he's introducing himself again. If you asked him what he, was, what he had done early on in his life, he'd tell you that he was a part of the military and worked hard at that. But if you asked him what he had for lunch, he couldn't tell you. Nor could he tell you what he was doing five minutes before in the hallway. But he could hold in a totally articulate and interesting conversation. Now, when he came in, he was also suffering from an extremity that was really quite severe and it was causing him to black out and they thought he was going to die and so they put him into a medically induced coma. Now when they did that, they found that his spinal cord fluid was just where it should be relatively clear by comparison. It was this sludgy mess. What they realized was that he had contracted a particular bacteria that was damaging the cells of his body. And they, so they put him into a medically induced coma for 10 days. When he came out of it, he recovered to everyone's surprise. No idea that that was going to happen. So when he did, and they started to kind of reconnect with him, they realized that while he could have these articulate conversations, almost all of the conversations he was having from, was from time in like the 70s and early, early 80s. Because the interesting thing was, was that this bacteria had damaged a part of his brain that controlled short-term memory. So much so that he didn't even know he had this condition. He had no idea. He had no clue why he was there, of course. And he could tell you these vast, wonderful stories holding these really great conversations, but again, they were all from 20 years prior. None of them were current. So, at the, about the same time, they had sent him home, or a little afterward, he was discharged from the hospital. He had gone home and tried to live a normal life. But as you can imagine, with an aging anybody, we all age at some point in time. I know some of you are working on immortality. I get it. But until then, we're all gonna be aging. And as he's aging, health concerns started to come up. And so his doctors encouraged he and his wife's more specifically to try and get out and exercise. But how do you encourage a person who has no memory to remember that he's supposed to do that? Or that he had done it 10 minutes prior or should be doing it in the next five? None of that was a reality for him. But habitually, uh, he and his wife would go out and his wife would take him on a walk around the neighborhood. It would take somewhere between about 40 and 45 minutes. And they did this effectively every single day. And as to be expected, certain elements of his health started to improve. Now, 
One day, they changed up the habit just a little bit. His wife wasn't paying attention, and Eugene decided to go on a walk on his own. Freaked out, she immediately went to all the neighbors, asking them, like, have you seen Eugene? Have you seen Eugene? Have you seen Eugene? She called the police department to see if it could find Eugene. And then, when all else failed, she went out on the road to see if she could find him across the streets. Eventually, slightly exasperated, came back home just to find him sitting on the couch in front of the television, having come back from the walk that he normally would take with his wife. This was quite curious, right? How could a person that can't remember anything remember a walk that he had never taken prior to the accident? How could he remember all of that? Now, they started to interview him every single week. They would come in, I think it was on a Sunday, and they'd come in and they'd interview him and just try and better understand what the impact had been. Now, he couldn't give you the layout of his house. He couldn't tell you where the kitchen was. If you asked him where the bathroom was, he couldn't tell you, but when he had to go to the bathroom, he'd stand up and walk right into it, go and come right back. He couldn't tell you what he had in the morning. However, every single morning, he'd wake up, make eggs, bacon and eggs, have a cup of coffee, and go back to bed every single morning. Now, none of these were habits or patterns that he had developed prior to the accident, none of them, but he was habitual into doing them. So what they discovered was this, that the mind is quite powerful in a lot of different ways. And one of those ways is that there are very distinct areas of the brain that control short and long-term memory. You may already know that. But in addition to that, what they discovered was that habit and routine can bypass short-term memory and go straight into long-term memory if done consecutively enough. That is what allowed Eugene to memorize or remember things without ever consciously remembering that that was in fact the case. He never had to remember what he had for breakfast because his body would just do it. Now I found this really quite captivating and it led me to this idea of what it was like for me as an actor. So in the bio, if you recall, I started my professional career as a stage actor. I don't have a degree in anything but theater, stage theater more specifically. And the two most common questions I get is one, how do you memorize all the lines? And two, do you ever get stage fright? The answer to both is the same. Yes and yes, because of process. And more specifically, because of rehearsal. Now, I'd imagine for everyone in this room, in fact, raise your hand if you've done any sort of performative art, uh, choral, music, acting, anything along those lines. Okay, so quite a few of you. I would imagine for all of you, the idea of rehearsing is commonplace. In fact, the notion of not rehearsing sounds totally insane. As a quick aside, in the Portland area, they do a show every single year where they put on a musical where all of the actors are unaware of one another. They have no clue who the other are. They never have rehearsed with any of the others. In fact, when the show starts, everyone is sitting in the audience and they discover who the other actors are when they stand up for the first time to come on stage and they pull off an entire musical, singing numbers, dancing routines, the whole nine yards, having never worked with the other person before. But what makes it work? The fact that each of those individuals rehearsed their part. So when they layer them over the top, it kind of works. <laughs> okay, and we ain't talking Broadway here, friends, okay? But it really got me thinking again about the notion of confidence and what, what drives that. A couple of years ago, our company was working with a couple of interns that were finishing up their code school experience. Three months in the code school, one of which had never written software in his entire life, and the other had, had done very little. And they were doing a one-month internship with us. Now, just on this day, I was working with them, and they were working on a Ruby on Rails application. And they were getting an error, and they were consistently getting the same error. It was a pretty standard one at that. What surprised me was it took them I think it was seven different instances of receiving the same, basically the same exact error for it to finally kick in, oh yeah, that's how I'm supposed to respond to that type of error. That's where I'm supposed to start looking. Now, this wasn't totally out of the norm. I'd seen this before, so, and I imagine for many of you, if you've ever worked with somebody who's new to something, you probably witnessed the same. And there was this innate kind of lack of confidence, right? I, even though it, it took me seven kind of tries to get there, I still felt like I, didn't know on try three, four, five, and six. Now, just later that day, I was working with some of our more experienced engineers, and coincidentally, they were working, they had experienced effectively the same error, right? But it only took two loops, two iterations to get there. And I was like, oh, interesting. 
But then I noticed something that was also quite fascinating too, is it clicked to me that when I looked at their screen, their windows were specific, right? They had the terminal on the left, and it was like the ID in the middle, and then they, right behind it, they had the, the browser, and then there were only tabs getting used. And I'd recalled from earlier on in that day that for the less experienced team, it was like things were everywhere. Everywhere. It was like things were half overlapped. There were, you know, four terminals open in five different windows and 14 different tabs. I mean, it was everywhere. So let me ask you a question for those of you who have written code for even more than a month. How many of you, raise your hand if you are habitual about the way you place the windows on the screen? I've asked this question over two dozen times to audiences just like this, and the response is always the same. Now, part of that, most of that has to do with cognitive load. What we're doing is effectively we're creating consistency in our experience so that we no longer have to focus on it. Now, I decided to run a quick experiment, and that was that, so what I told the interns on the, the beginning of their third week is I said, just go with me for a moment. For this week, I want you to put the editor in the middle, I want you to put the browser behind it, I want you to put the terminal on the left-hand side of the screen. Only use tabs, don't open new windows. Just stick with that consistently. Don't divert, hold yourself accountable. They were pair programming. Hold each other accountable and stick with it. I was expecting that by the end of the week, that loop of seven would start to drop just across the board. Like all instances where that would be happening, the, the list, it would get far more truncated. It was within hours. Within a matter of hours, we were down to two and three iterations at most. I thought this was really quite interesting. So the following Monday, the last week of their internship, I said, okay, we're gonna switch it up again, right? And sure enough, they went right back to chaos. How many of you pair program at any point in time? Raise your hand. How many of you effing hate it when your pair switches up the colors in the terminal? Totally, throws everything off. It's like all of a sudden you went back to the dark ages of living. You're like, there's no way, I can't write code anymore because of this. I mean, I'm serious, right? It's totally real. Our bodies, our minds are built around certainty and uncertainty playing a dramatic and radical role on how confident we naturally feel. Like I said before, do I ever get stage fright? Yes, in fact, right before I went on, you were asking about exactly that. And the answer is yes. I've given this talk specifically two dozen times. I've given dozens and dozens of talks. I've performed in dozens and dozens of shows, hundreds of productions, and I get butterflies in my stomach, like many of you probably do, all the time, but here's what I know. What I know is that the moment my foot steps on the stage, the moment I put this in my hand, the moment all of this gets turned on, my body is gonna to start to take over. And that's all I need to rely on. And that's the beautiful thing. So my question was, is why don't we do that more often in writing code? Is there the notion of rehearsal, the notion of practice, the notion of routine? We talk about process, yes, but do we talk about the other things? So taking a moment and a quick step back and looking at other examples, there's this sports ball player. He's very famous for playing sports ball. This is Steph Curry, <clears throat> for those of you who don't know. He's arguably the, if not one of, if not the most um, successful basketball players in history. He was on track to beat the record for the most consecutive free throws. He was in the, the mid-40s, so he was only like two games at most away from beating the record of 50 at the time. And he, uh, during an interview, he was asked, are you nervous, right? Are you nervous about that? And this was his response. Honestly, this past game is the first time I've actually thought about it. Since I haven't missed one, it's on my mind. I'm gonna do more laser focus, I'm gonna be more laser focused on the mechanics and the rhythm of shooting free throws until the streak is over. It wasn't, I'm gonna believe in myself until I'm ready, right? It was, I'm gonna do the routine. I'm gonna do what I know time and time and time again. So my hypothesis is this, and that is that confidence is not the result of belief and time alone. That is the byproduct of belief and time. Confidence is in fact the result of ingrained routine. The more routine you can build into the work we do, especially if you're a mentor mentee, the more we can do that, the more successful we will be as individuals, as practitioners, and as a team. This woman is, is incredible. She's the definition of a badass. So she was one of the first, this is Tammy Jo Schultz. If you don't know her, <clears throat> you can look up Southwest Flight 1153. She is, um, not too long ago, this happened mid-flight. 
as an aside, I was actually on a Southwest flight for the first time giving this talk. I was in this perspective in the middle seat. My person over, I, could, I noticed he was kept looking over my shoulder. I showed this picture of this, and that was his view. It was priceless, friends, just utterly priceless. Anyway, so here's what happened, is there was a malfunction that happened on the left, whatever that is, what side is that, left? That one, the left side, um, that, uh, that shot off, ruptured the cabin, caused it to depressurize, and they were on the verge of crashing, okay? Now here's the thing about Tammy Jo Schultz that makes her quite impressive. Oh, and by the way, as you can imagine, she landed the plane. There was a woman that was partially sucked out, she passed away, but otherwise she saved everyone else on the plane. Now here's the thing you have to know about Tammy, is that she is, I mean a badass. Like she is, uh, was one of the very first lieutenants um, in the uh, Navy Reserve, or Lieutenant Commander in the Navy Reserve, and she, fought she flew fighter pilots. She was one of the first female Lieutenant Commanders. So this was the right person to have in the cockpit at the time. There's no doubt about it. Now, when asked about this specific flight, this was her response. We knew from our training and took the knowledge that we had, pooled it, and used our system knowledge, and it worked. If you take a moment, go to YouTube, and you can listen to the flight recording of it, and it's eerie. It's eerie in the sense that she is so calm, she is so collected, so collected. I mean, let's be clear. She has 100 plus people behind her where the odds of survival are incredibly low. There is a woman that she is aware of that has been partially sucked out. There's an explosion that's unexplainable down to one engine and it all lands on her shoulders, okay? And she is calm as a cucumber. It's astounding, okay? Now, there are some people in the world that I'm pretty sure are crazy, like legitimately nuts. That would be Alex Honnold. Now, if you don't know about Alex, let me explain a little bit about this guy. Alex Honnold is, is a world famous climber. Arguably, he is the best free solo climber on the planet. Now, what is free solo climbing, you, you might ask? Let me tell you. Free solo climbing is where you're climbing by yourself, without assistance, and without any supports or uh, safety, harnesses, nets, you name it, right? Now, what made him really famous was he started to climb some of the world's hardest rock climbs, rock faces on the planet. Now, one of the pinnacles of rock climbing is El Capitan in Yosemite. El Capitan is this grant, basically this granite sheet, right? I mean, darn near close to glass. Granite sheet that goes 3,000 feet up. The best rock climbers in the world have a hard time climbing this sucker. And he did it without he did it without any ropes or harnesses. There's a movie, if you're traveling back, it's on Yuhulu and whatnot called Free Solo about him. Now this is an image of what it looks like, right? Like I said, if there's anyone that feels crazy to me in my life, I think it's probably him, right? <clears throat> but here's what blew me away, and I highly encourage all of you to watch the documentary. It is incredible. Is what blew me away was not the feet. The feet is, insane in and of itself. It was actually the meticulous nature of the planning and preparation that he and his team went through to make sure that that was more likely than not. He didn't just climb up onto a rock face, right? He didn't be like, I'm gonna be that guy, right? That didn't happen. I'm gonna show you a video of specifically Pitch 20, Pitch 29, 28, um, which is referred to as the boulder problem. Now, if you're not familiar, uh, there is two different ways in which distance is tracked as a rock climber, and one of them is as a pitch, and a pitch is effectively a length of rope. So when they say pitch 20, pitch 10, pitch 30, whatever that is, that's that many rope lengths of distance, or thereabouts, okay? And so routes are planned that way, and there's this one route called the boulder problem. Now, the boulder problem is this really, really tricky spot, and I'm gonna play a video where I want you specifically to pay very close attention to the language, right? Listen to how he's talking through the problem. Or don't. Or don't. Yep, I'm there. It's a very intricate sequence. You've got your right hand on a crane. Let me go back real quick. We'll do that again. 
but the boulder problem has a 10-foot section that's incredibly difficult. It's a very intricate sequence. You've got your right hand on a crimp, left hand on a side pull, and then you put your right foot onto this dimple thing. Right hand goes up to a small down pulling crimp, left foot goes into a little dish, and then you drive up off the left foot into the thumb press. That's the worst hold on the entire route, so you get maybe half your thumb on the hold. Then you roll your two fingers over the thumb, switch your feet, left foot stems out to this really bad sloping black foothold. Switch your thumbs. And then reach out left to a big sloping bread loaf type hold that feels kind of grainy. From there, either karate kick or double dino to an edge on the opposite wall. In some ways, it makes more sense to do the big two-handed jump because you're jumping to a good edge, so there's actually something to catch. But the idea of jumping without a rope seems completely outrageous. No if kidding. You miss it, that's that. <laughs> yeah, totally. That's the part that's outrageous if you're wondering. Yeah. So at that point in time, he's approximately, he's just shy of 2,000 feet in the air. Okay. Now that's not the point that he actually does it. But again, listen to the language. <clears throat> it's very meticulous. Rotation. Now I want to point something out. <clears throat> okay. The point where he talks about rolling his hand up. The only way he's holding on to that, to that rock face, this is the only way it works, is by the pressure between his, his thumb moving up and his toe moving down. The gap, the amount of space his fingers are sitting on is three millimeters. Yeah, that's what it's like climbing this sucker. I've never climbed it, what am I talking about? That's what it looks like for him to climb it, okay? Now when asked about this, this was his response. Um, to expand my comfort zone and work through the fear by practicing the moves over and over again until it's just not scary anymore. He climbed that rock face 50 plus times. <clears throat> so many times that he literally ran the routine. That's all he did. Nothing new. There was no fancy poses. There was no selfies on the rock. No, just the same routine. There's always something that has to give you the confidence. Sometimes the confidence has come through preparation and rehearsal. <clears throat> Raise your hand if you know how to drive a car. Very good. I do too. I've driven since I was my late teens. It was a very successful teenage years of mine. I did not crash once, but I got plenty of speeding tickets. I was very successful at this. Then a couple of years back, I was asked to go give a talk. Coincidentally, this one, if you might ask. So I went over to the wonderful country of the United Kingdom, and this happened. <laughs> Brought my family, wife, Parents, I was pretty sure I was going to kill them all that day. Yep, we rented this car. Oh, cool. We rented this car. Yes, I know. It was a Vita, or it was a Mazda. I was familiar with said Mazda. I used to own one. Yes, we got in the car, and I realized again, I'm going to kill everybody today. And they were pretty certain I was going to do the same. But we'd all go down together, right? So looking back, it was very coincidental because this was the day before the talk. I was thinking a lot about like what the differences were, right? And like what the mental process was. And I want you for a moment, even if you haven't gone through this experience of jumping to the other side of the car, right? Or not jumping to, but driving from the other side of the car. How many times things like this have happened? Now here's what happened in my mind, is first reaction, the uncertainty, right? Colors changed in the terminal. First thing that happened is, oh my gosh, everything's new. I'm totally thrown off. I don't know that I can do this. My uncertainty is through the floor, right? I have been driven, driving for 20 plus years and I was convinced that there was a high probability, at least a 50-50 chance that I was gonna end up in an accident or we were gonna have to stop, right? But then within a matter of just a few moments, an auditing process started to happen. What's the same? What's the same? Oftentimes we talk about what's different, what's unique, what's not the same here. But that's not how our brains actually work. Our brains work the other way around. We're actually not great at seeing what's different. We're awesome at seeing what's the same. So first thing that I look at is the same. Well, the wheel's the same, same size, same relative position. Pedals are the same. Yeah, gauges are relatively the same. Slightly different, right? 
kilometers versus miles, but by and large the same. Okay, um, what else is the same? Oh, well, <clears throat> this on the left is very different, but is it that different? Well, I guess not. You know, actually what's the same is everything on it, it's just on my left side. Got it. So the auditing process that our brains often go through is again, what is the same? If you're a team leader or you um, help mentor people, I highly advise you turn the question from and what's different to what is the same. When you're, uh, when you're mentoring new or less experienced folks, help them identify what's the same in the situation, not what's different. When you can work through that problem with them, the magic starts to really happen and the, and the learning process becomes much and much faster. It's not the other way around. In fact, too often, when we start to looking at the things that are different, we'll start to discover that we'll, we'll take things like, oh, well, it looks different as being the difference, when functionally it's exactly the same, okay? So this is, all of this is referred to effectively in a book um, called The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. And he models, and he outlines effectively what the, the habit process looks like, right? And it's very basic, right? So the first thing is that there's a cue, some cue, some trigger, some trigger that goes off, all right? And that trigger rolls into some routine. Something happens directly following that. And there's a reward on the other side, right? So the cue is I'm driving a car, okay? The routine is, is that I'm going to use the pedals and the wheel to get us there. And the reward is I got us there, right? So this loop that happens is a really critical loop. It gets us into a good habit. The more and more you can create this in the things that you do and how you do it, the more successful you are at that, the more powerful it becomes. However, there's a missing component from this. And I, oh, this is a bigger audience. This is great. This is amazing. Come, everybody. Let's go over time and piss off the organizers. <laughs> Just kidding. Love you guys. OK. But there is a way to make this habit forming process go fast. So can we learn faster? So for all of you that are here, I have a question for you. This represents three different digits. What digits do they represent? And if you've seen this before, shut up. But if you haven't, what three digits does this represent? You can throw out answers. What's the first one? Nine, seven, what else? Two, four, what else? Eight, okay, how about the second one? Middle one? Five, seven, because it looks like a seven. Yes. How about the last? Zero. Zero, okay, all right, very good. Well, you're wrong, but that's okay. Don't worry about it. I'm gonna help you all out. I'm gonna give you the key, okay? So I all need you now to pay very close attention. I want you to burn these into your mind, okay? Down to the left, over, down, circle shape, ready? Okay, down left, left, circle shape, ready? Here's the key. Find them on the map, okay? Find them on the map. Okay, you got it? Down to the left, over, down, circle shape, yeah? You got it, yes? Yeah. Great, what are those? <laughs> I did. You can't memorize nine things? Nine, nine friends, nine. Okay, so let me give it to you one more time. All right, this is your second chance, friends, second. Okay, down and over, little C-shaped thing, whatever thing. Okay, ready? One more time, here you go. <laughs> you got it? I think you know where this is going, right? What I'm about to do in the next one. I know you're all thinking, you're like, this is stupid. I'm not gonna try and remember this. He's gonna throw three more up, okay? I get it. How many times have you thrown documentation at new people and said, this tells you everything you need to know? <laughs> yeah, a few times maybe. I know I've done it. But here's the missing link. Here's the chunk that makes it all worthwhile. Perspective. I can give you the same information with a little bit of why and all of a sudden things start to make sense. Are you ready for that? Yes? Let me give you a little bit of perspective. <laughs> First time I've ever heard, that's clever, that's great, that's good, yeah. Okay, you got it now? Now watch this, I haven't even given you enough time, but can you tell me what those three are? Oh my gosh, you're brilliant. Look how fast you're learning. Clearly, you needed 20 years to get there, right? You're right, nine, six, and eight. Oh, wait, oh, a new one, throwing you out something new. Seven, two, 
You were right about that one, everybody. Seven, two, and four. Perspective is so essential, friends. It really, really is, right? Too often we throw that at people. If you're a maintainer of a README on an open source project, when, when you're like, can you not just read the thing to somebody that's contributed something, just remember that perspective matters a lot. Purpose, why, what's the structure, why are things phrased and done that way, matters a ton. And it can take something from looking at two things and being totally confused and trying to hold it all in your memory to something that's like, oh, that's the pattern that's getting used. That's the way this is being put together. So, I will say it again, confidence, I do not believe confidence is solely the, the result of belief and definitely not the result of exclusively time. It's the result of successful routine. And the more you can do that, the better, truly, for you as team leaders, for you as yourself, and everywhere in the middle, truly, it, it really does help. Now, I have one more ask. Who wants an ask? What is an ask, you ask? Okay. I'm actually putting together, I'm, I'm taking the opportunity in front of all of you, as well as all the other conferences I've been at, giving the same talk, to try and put together a real summation of what confidence looks like in practice for you. So I have a totally free survey. It's, it's got simple questions on it. I'm not gonna advertise to you or any of that. And in fact, I will incentivize you because I could really use your feedback because so far a very small subset of you will actually do it, probably because you don't trust me yet. But trust, trust me, <laughs> I don't know, okay? I will give you the book, The Power of Habit, and all you have to do is find me on Twitter and send me a direct message. That's all you gotta do. The survey will take you about three minutes. That's it. You're gonna give me your address, and I will shoot you the book, with my notes in it, in fact. So I'll even show you the points that led to this conference talk, if you want it. Now, if you've read this book, in fact, raise your hand if you've read this book. Okay, cool. You might not have read that book, because if you wanna pick between the two, I'll give you that option, too. Essentialism in my life is like essential reading. It has nothing to do with software development, neither of them do on the surface, but indirectly it has everything to do with it. Um, I've been recording podcasts over the last little while, and this book, in its way, essentialism and essential thinking have come up time and time again, and I would imagine many of these talks are the same. Well, thank you so very much for letting me occupy all your time. Again, my name's Adam Cuppy. I work for a company called Zeal. You can find us online. We're a software consultancy that specializes in specifically process and routine. How do you do that in your code? How do you do that amongst your team? We work with you, not against you, and not sidecar to you. It's all together. Um, if you want to know more about me, again, my Twitter handle was that one down there. Please, if you want to participate in a few-minute survey, I would love it, and I'll send you a book for nothing, okay? Thank you so very much. <laughs>